Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next session for today with Rocio Fatas from Spain. Rocio is an interaction designer and design educator from Spain. She has worked as a faculty of human centered design and visual communication at Sristi Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore, where she leads the BDES program in HCD. She has a background in fine arts and virtual archaeology. She completed her master's in interactive digital media from Trinity College, Dublin. Her decade long work experience includes web development and interactive digital design. She is interested in exploring interaction design at the crossroads of human activities and the natural world. Today, Rocio will be talking about interactions with the natural world. Welcome to UID Rocio and over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ananta. Um, good morning, everyone. So as I have just been introduced, uh, I don't see the slides so though. Can, can you maybe? Sure. Yeah, we just played. Yeah, it's on the screen now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, as I've just been introduced, my inter my interest is in exploring the interaction design at the crossroads between human activities and the natural world. So this workshop is titled Interactions with the Natural World. It is designed to be an interactive session. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through an example myself, which you can then uh, do your own uh, exercise in your own time. So the subtitle of this um, workshop is What We Do is How We Are. So what does this mean? It means that we do only as much and in such ways as we are configured by nature. So we are perceptive organisms. We have different um, sensory uh, systems in the body and that sensory system, um, those sen sensory systems shape the way that we interact with the world. Can you please show the next slide? So this is me. My name is Rocio. Um, Rocio means Shabnam in Hindi. Or um, so to put it in the nature perspective and an interactive nature perspective, I say that my name is Morning Plants H2O and I am composed of an X amount of interacting cells. So uh, the next slide, please. This is a whiteboard that I have created for the workshop. And uh, if uh, maybe Anita can, I don't know if you can um, open that link, uh, that would be great and share it too. But otherwise, um, the, it will be shared with the students at a later time. Um, and actually, um, that's not exactly the like link because that's an older presentation. Anyway, we'll share. I'll share the, the link later. With you. No problem. Yeah, so, we can play the link later. Um, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, we are here, all human beings are working with memories, imaginations, and different types of knowledge when we are in the world. You know, there are the very different types of knowledges. Uh, we can uh, scientifically describe knowledge as being empirical, that which is based on experience, a prioristic, that which has been previously acquired, tacit, that which is inherently known, and other types of knowledge. So once uh, you will be ready, you can join the, the whiteboard and uh, on Miro and follow a set of steps that I am going to follow right now to do this exercise, which is um, a map of interactions at the crossroads of human activity, in, your case, in, in this case, your own human activity, but based on your memories and your imagination and different types of knowledge that you have, 
and the natural world. Next slide, please. Hello? Yes. So, nature is interactive. What does that exactly mean? So, activity is active according to the Cambridge Dictionary. Active means busy with a particular activity. And activity is described as that situation in which a lot of things are happening or people are moving around. Um, and so, inter means in between in Latin, between or among the people, things or places mentioned. So nature uh, is interactive, at least that's how we understand it, because we are interactive beings. So we perceive the world and we respond to it. And in, in turn, we change it, we affect it. And the world comes back to us in a different way. And then again, we interplay, interact with it. So when was the last time that you immerse yourself in nature? And I mean nature as being an environment which is natural uh, rather than man-made. So for this exercise, I'm just asking you to pick a memory. And in my and this first of all, following a, a number of steps, we will reach the maturity of the exercise. So the first step to follow is to describe the situation in which you are immersed in nature. In my case, I had picked this memory of one time when I was in the Amazon forest in Brazil and I had gone to a natural park where I could swim in an impressive waterfall uh, surrounded by all kinds of wildness. But it was a tamed wildness. Otherwise, I wouldn't have dared, sure. But it still, it was a, not a man-made environment as we understand it. It was, there were no built uh, constructions of any sort. It was all rocks, water, plants, animals of every kind, and then a few visitors like me. So that is my description of my situation. Now, um, something else that was very defining of the situation was that as I was reading the waterfall where I knew I could see, there was a sign that read that after 5 p.m. or around 5 p.m., leopards would come to the waterfall to drink water, which meant that we had to leave there before that time, of course. Okay, so that is my situation that I have chosen to describe. What would be the next step for me, for us to take? So, um, where, what were the agents that uh, were taking part of that situation? Um, agents meaning those uh, entities that could possibly act or do something and therefore are uh, keen on interacting with me. But we're still in, in the previous slides, sorry. So agents, in this case, I have listed as myself, number one uh, agent. Second agent would be the water of the waterfall and the river. Number third agent would be other people. Number four would be rocks, because while they're not uh, living beings, they still have potential to move. And then the leopards, even though they're not really present there at that time, they will become at some point. And then anyhow, they're very present in my own mind. And then uh, some beautiful giant butterflies that be fluttering around and other impressive uh, insects like dragonflies. Okay, so that would be the second thing I have 
realistic mm, now uh, as i was saying our human nature is interactive just like nature is that means that according to the again cambridge dictionary that it has the qualities faults and feelings that people have of course we are people so you know we have the, the definition refers to us um, when um, describing humans so but as opposed to gods animals or machines okay um, traditionally this is how we have been defined um, as humanity we're not gods we're not animals nor machines and one particular characteristic that uh, is supposed to is that animals also definitely have machines also imitate as we build them and gods are meant to have as well is that we sense the world and we respond to it through instincts emotions and thoughts so there are these three levels in which we interact one would be our gut reaction, uh, which would be our instincts, something that happens without any or apparent mediation of any rational thought. It's just an evolutionary treat that we have developed to adapt to our environment. Then we would also have emotions, which are those things that are common to all mammals, and um, that um, um, keep us, help us bond with each other and get attached to places and also um, build a sense of identity. And finally, we have thoughts, which are those rational responses that uh, happen in the neocortex of our brain. Uh, which is the most advanced uh, feature of our interactive uh, nature. And uh, so the next step then will be to list the sensory perceptions that I'm having when I am immersed in that natural environment. So for that, I have created a list of all the five uh, traditional senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And um, create a quick list of what are those immediate first memories that I have um, around those sensory um, organs or coming from those sensory organs, uh, perceptive um, systems. So in my sense of sight, my memory is of that, that of the, um, that my vision is limited due to the falling of water over me. That's when I am inside, under the water, inside the water, under the waterfall already. When I am outside, what I notice is that my view is completely natural. There is no man-made object or other than my own clothes and the things that I bring and my other uh, friends bring and other humans that are visiting as well. Uh, with regards to hearing, I hear, I notice, I remember that the sound of the water was very high, very loud, and that I have to shout in order to be able to communicate again. That's why I am inside the, under the water, under the, the waterfall. And that has a consequence, which is that I am much more aware of my own thoughts. In the sense of smell, I remember that the, the smell was not very identifiable, or at least I don't have that strong a memory, but it feels fresh and clean. So uh, the smell is not a rational sense, which means it's not processed in our neocortex, therefore we don't have actual memories from smell, but um, we can recognize smells nonetheless. So my memory is not there uh, as a consequence, but I do have some associations uh, with uh, um, the sense of smell that are based on that memory. Um, then my sense of taste, again, it's not a rational sense, so I hardly remember, remember the sense of taste, but I imagine that it is a little neutral, like clean water. 
And finally, the sense of touch. What I remember most vividly is that the water falls hard on my skin and the sun keeps it vibrant and warm, my skin, that is. Okay, thank you. So now let's move on to the next slide, please. And um, in different activities, when uh, we experience them, possess different qualities. For example, fear, mystery, joy, beauty. This is a combination of mostly emotional responses, but also uh, our rational and instinctive um, um, systems interfere with them. So um, I'm, the next thing for me to do would be to this down. What are those experiential qualities of my memory? And so um, I remember that the situation felt energizing. It felt enriching, as in I was uh, very conscious that I was having a precious experience that is not something I would normally uh, have access to in my regular life events and it also felt refreshing it was very hot and and humid and and just going inside under the water felt that i was my body was regulated its temperature back to uh, an ideal uh, one okay and so the next thing i would want to do is to pick one of those uh, qualities that i have just described and make a little empathy map. An empathy map is normally a tool that is used in uh, experience design. This is experience design to gauge and uh, gather all the different types of uh, reactions, responses that different people have to a particular given situation. In this case, I'm just using it as a tool to get to, uh, to gain some, some insight into my own memories. So what are the components of an empathy map are what is the person doing? What was I doing? And I was standing under the waterfall because I've chosen to uh, uh, map the uh, quality of energizing. Okay, so I was standing under the waterfall and what was I thinking? I was thinking, I hope the leopards won't come now. And what did I say? What was I saying? I was shouting, asking for the time and for a picture of me to be taken. Um, I, because my friends couldn't hear me, I couldn't hear them so well, so I had to shout out. And um, and uh, I was scared for the leopards. I couldn't wear my watch, so I had to ask for the, for for the time. And of course, I wanted to keep a memory, so I was asking for a picture. And what, but what was I feeling? I had a feeling of being daring, um, uh, an exhilarating feeling as well. And I was also feeling a little bit scared. Okay, so that is all the um, elements that compose my memory that can then help me um, build an interactive experience map. Oh, sorry, interaction experience map. Next slide, please. So now we're going down to the sequential detail. That, that means that we are adding a temporal dimension to the experience uh, that we're uh, mapping as, interact as an interaction. So we're going in from the macro to the micro. So we're, uh, we have described the situation and environment and we're now just going to go down into the detail and find the most and least enjoyable aspects and steps in a sequence of actions. Okay, so the next um, step to be taken is to map the interaction with as much detail as possible, including sensory perceptions, decisions, and, and actions at the micro level. Okay, so I have listed 11 steps in my case. In your case, it might be something else completely different and very different number of steps. It could be anything between three steps and, I don't know, 100. The challenge here would be to try and uh, 
break it down into as many steps as possible. Um, but how do you know when something, you know, what to call a step? Well, we have these references where something is um, uh, an action or a decision. Um, uh, an action, a decision, or um, or a perception, okay? Distinctive perception. So the steps that I have listed down in my case are, number one, I arrive to the place and spot the sign. Leopards come to drink at 5 p.m. Number two is that I look at the time and calculate, do I have enough time to dip into the waterfall? And number three is that, well, I have decided yes, and therefore now I take an action. So I'm just going to get into my gear and, um, and I do that. So once I have done that, I decide to walk into the water. I have to cross the, water, the body of water in order to reach the waterfall. I have to swim there. It's a small thing. So that would be my step number four. Now, step number five is that I have reached the waterfall. And step number six is that I stay beneath it and try different yoga postures. I have this challenge that I've created for myself that I'm just going to do that. And I'm going to try and stay as focused and as much under the water as possible. Number seven is that I communicate my sensations to my friends. It's this very emotional reaction that I'm having that it's so joyous, the situation that I just want to share it. And so I'm telling them, oh, this is so nice. This is the best. You should try it yourselves. Number eight step is that I go out from under the water. And number nine is that I swim back to my clothes. Number 10 is that I have, that I explain the situation to some other visitors that are wondering if this is a good idea to do or not. So I'm just telling them actually, it's, I, I was just there and it was great. And final step is that I get ready to leave before five. Uh, so that I won't get uh, caught by the leopards. So, um, okay, so next step, next slide, please. So finally, uh, what uh, can be done here is in order to start like putting this into an actual um, uh, very detailed map that can be then translated into some form of illustration for an interaction that can then be dated in a digital world format, for example, would be to uh, choose a part of that sequence. In my case, I've chosen no, from steps number two, which is when I look at the time and calculate to the step number six, which is when I stay beneath it, beneath the, the, the waterfall and try a few yoga postures. And I'm just going to list down what are in each of those uh, micro steps, what are the elements uh, the, the sensory perceptions, sensory um, uh, systems that are most important. So in the number two, look at the time and calculate the uh, sense of sight will be the most prominent the one I'm using the most. Get swimming my, in my swimming clothes, I will be using my sense of couch. When I get into the water and reach the waterfall, I will be using my sense, of course, my eyesight, my sense of touch um, to make sure that you know, I'm not stepping on anything that is going to bite me or um, I'm not going to bump into any rocks. And my sense of, um, of hearing as well, so that to know that I am out of danger. So finally, which for each of those steps, then I would just um, <clears throat> create a mini map where I would list down what is the perception, what, what is the decision that I'm taking and what is the action. So in the case of um, Asanas in the waterfall, that is the name that I give into that last step, would be my perception would be sight. I can only see myself so much. 
my sense of touch would be it is harder to keep the balance under this pressure and my sense of hearing would be the loud sound of the water helps me concentrate. The decision that I have made is to choose the right standing asana and the action that I've taken is to practice this asana under the waterfall which I can then illustrate with the drawing. So that will be all. That's the process that I'm inviting you all to follow. And I will be sharing the link where you can find a template and do this exercise yourselves in your own time. And that's it. I hope you have enjoyed. And I look forward to meeting you again and seeing your um, own exercises on the board that I'm going to be sharing. Okay, hi, Rocio, and thank you so much for this session where you reminded us of the holistic role of our senses and instincts as the point of difference between humans and other life forms, and thus our variable responses to nature. It is imperative for us as designers to understand this, get inspired by this, and apply it in our design practice. Uh, your talk on rational and instinctive behaviors leaves us with a heightened sense of observation and perception. So thank you so much for that and for making the time for our students at UID. We would love to have you on campus and take it from there. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you, Angie, too. All the best.